Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jonathan Clinthorne, and I'm here on behalf of Atkins Nutritionals. Today I want to discuss two major points. The first is that while it has been stated that the 2020 dietary guidelines are intended for the general population, the general population is not healthy. 72% of American adults are overweight or obese, 52% have prediabetes or diabetes. Therefore, by excluding studies from your systematic reviews that enroll participants in a treatment diet, you are effectively not producing guidelines for the general population, something suggested by the National Academy's report. Ultimately, that's well over 100 million people who are not receiving relevant eating guidance. It's also important to recognize that despite the fact that the guidelines are intended for the general healthy population, they are most definitely influencing nutrition recommendations for people who are not considered healthy. Let me give some examples. The guidelines inform school lunch programs. Current data indicates one in five school-aged children has obesity, while about 20% of adolescents are estimated to have prediabetes. They also inform nutrition recommendations for the Department of Veterans Affairs and feeding programs for the elderly. And yet the prevalence of type 2 diabetes is higher in veterans than it is in the general population, and nearly one in three are considered obese. Meanwhile, one in four elderly people are estimated to have type 2 diabetes, and 48% of people 65 and older have prediabetes. The guidelines also clearly inform the nutrition policy for many medical associations and hospitals. And if these healthcare providers are not guiding people who have diet-related chronic diseases, then who is? The guidelines are clearly being used to provide nutritional recommendations for many people with diet-related chronic diseases. So why not make sure that these guidelines are based on pertinent science? My second point is that during your assessment of dietary patterns, you must accurately define low-carbohydrate diets in order to properly account for this body of research. The USDA has stated that you are inclu considering including studies where less than 45% of energy coming from carbohydrates is qualifying as a low-carbohydrate diet because this is outside of the AMDR. I am here to tell you that this is an inaccurate characterization of low-carbohydrate diets. We encourage the USDA, USDA to define low-carbohydrate diets as containing less than 25% of energy from carbohydrate or 130 grams of carbohydrates per day. This recommendation would be consistent with the adequate intake of 130 grams of carbohydrates per day set by the National Academy. In conclusion, I strongly encourage the advisory, advisory committee to focus on the good of all Americans and accurately define low-carbohydrate diets. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have commenter number 16. My name is Chris Palmer. I'm a physician and researcher at Harvard Medical School. As we all know, we now have epidemics of obesity and diabetes in this country. Most people assume these problems are fairly straightforward. They are, after all, lifestyle diseases. They revolve around choices, what people eat and whether they exercise. Simple explanations with simple solutions. Eat less, exercise more. I'm here to tell you that it is not so simple. You see, back 25 years ago when I was a young physician, I was following the dietary guidelines to a T eating the recommended diet and exercising regularly. I was meticulous about it because I wanted to avoid the fate that I saw in the hospital every day. And yet the guidelines didn't work for me. I had high blood pressure and high cholesterol even though I was only in my 20s. After years of the guidelines not working, I was told that I had to go on medications. In a last ditch act of defiance, I changed my diet to a low carbohydrate diet. Lo and behold, after three months, all of my cardiac risk profiles improved dramatically. I have never looked back and I've remained healthy off medications for 23 years now on this diet. As a physician, I want to understand what happened. Why did the guidelines fail me and what can we do about it going forward? One clear problem with past guidelines is that they weren't based on the best science. They were based on correlational studies, not randomized controlled trials. Everyone knows that correlation doesn't equal causation. I wish the past guidelines committee knew that. We also know that when diets leave people feeling hungry, they are destined to fail. If people often feel hungry, maintaining a normal weight is next to impossible. We now have science showing that hunger is driven by many hormones and their effects on the brain. One of these is insulin. When a brain is insulin resistant, it is hungry. So what can we do about this? One solution already proven to work is eating a low carbohydrate diet. You see, the science now explains why this diet has worked so well for me, but it is not just me. As a physician, I've seen this work in countless patients. I have a patient right now who's lost over 150 pounds and has kept it off for over four years. He's still going strong. And by the way, he also has schizophrenia. 
Most people see him as profoundly ill and unmotivated, yet he did this and is still doing it because it works. With accurate and effective advice, even he can maintain a healthy weight now. And his cardiac risk profile improved dramatically too. I ask you to prioritize the science and include a low carbohydrate diet as at least one option in the new guidelines. The American Diabetes Association has done this and so should you. Hundreds of millions of people are counting on all of you to get this right. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tony Martinez, and I'm from Ossining, New York. I'm an attorney. I'm a type 2 diabetes and heart disease patient in remission through a ketogenic carnivorous diet. And I'm also a candidate for the New York State Senate in my district because I'm very concerned on these issues. I had a heart attack on March 29, 2014, and I have recovered through a diet alone, basically on a, on a ketogenic carnivorous diet for five and a half years. And I have now have saved over $24,000 in prescription drugs that I otherwise would have required had I not put my condition into remission. I understand that people here have very strong feelings about what people should be eating and, and so forth, but the point is, I have to say, is we have to have options, particularly option, a low-carb option and the fact that this needs to be recognized. Low-carb means 25% of calories, not 45, with all due respect. Uh, and because that's basically, I keep my calories to about 20% carbohydrate. Uh, and these guidelines that you're going to be putting together have to take into account options that the majority of this country is not healthy. We need uh, metabolically healthy. So we need to have options. And to give, you one, to give you some input on how impactful this is in my state, right now, diabetes costs the state of New York on Medicaid dollars alone over $1.5 billion. That's for the neediest group of community in our, our state, people who really need health care. And the, 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 the over the budget, the Medicaid budget right now is in a deficit of $6 million. And our governor, Governor Cuomo, has announced in his budget statement he's going to cut $2.5 billion across the board uh, if the legislature doesn't do one or both of two things, raise taxes or cut services on their own. And nobody likes that and nobody needs to be in that position. We need some flexibility. So... Uh, the fact that I've been able to save over $24,000 in prescription drug costs simply by following a ketogenic carnivorous diet, which works for me, and just for the record, if I clarify, the most nutrient-dense foods are animal-based. They're not plant-based. Uh, so we need options, and we need to uh, temper our passions about imposing our views on everybody. We just need options. So I ask for the committee for that consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Igus, and I'm here today representing myself and millions of people that have faithfully followed the guidelines only to find themselves in poor health. Year after year, diet after diet, I ate according to the government's recommendations in an effort to lose weight, but found it impossible to sustain. It left me chronically hungry, morbidly obese, and pre-diabetic. Over and over, I was told that eating everything in moderation, calories in, calories out, following the guidelines was the answer. And it wasn't working because I must be doing it wrong. I needed more self-control, more willpower. It was all my fault. When my mother died suddenly from congestive heart failure, a direct result of type 2 diabetes, I woke up and clearly saw my future. Devastated by her death, I realized if I didn't try something different, I would suffer the same fate. So a few years ago, imprisoned in a body with a seemingly insurmountable 200 pounds to lose, I did some research and discovered a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. I started eating real whole foods, protein, vegetables, dairy, and fats to satiety. I don't eat when I'm not hungry. I don't count calories. It's that simple. No gimmicks, no fads, no special products. To date, I have lost 173 pounds. I have reversed prediabetes, and my cardiovascular health is vastly improved. Triglycerides cut in half, cholesterol great. 
I have successfully reclaimed my health by not following the guidelines, and I'm far from alone in this. Thousands of us are following a low-carbohydrate plan after finding out we could not depend on the harmful advice we were given. Our trusted medical community following the guidelines has failed us. It is not that we were fat, sick, and lazy. We were fat, sick, and misinformed. If just one of many quote-unquote experts I saw over the years had looked at the rigor of science, I and countless others like me might not have been tortured for decades. I might have had the life I was meant to live. What so few are aware of, well, aware of is that the guidelines are not for people who are metabolically unwell. Those with prediabetes, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, which altogether is a staggering 88% of this country. The guidelines are only for the remaining 12% whose bodies are metabolically flexible enough to handle more than half of their calories from carbohydrates and six servings of grains a day. But what about the rest of us? What are you offering those of us who became sick and damaged under your watch? A true and proper definition of low carb is under 25% of calories. Anything more and the benefits are greatly reduced. If this option had been available, the countless doctors I saw over four decades of trying to get healthy would have been able to offer me a solution that actually works. What most doctors won't know is that this option is safe and effective unless you allow for it to be one of the approved dietary patterns. Until then, their hands are tied and we all get sicker with a one-size-fits-all option. You have the power to finally, finally end so much suffering by reversing course on the health epidemics that are ravaging this nation. Please land on the right side of history and be the heroes our country so desperately needs. It's long overdue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Darren Schmidt. I spoke to you in July in D.C. I focus on nutrition in my practice, my private practice, since uh, for 23 years at the Nutritional Healing Center of Ann Arbor. My clinicians and I have seen 60,000 nutrition visits in the last five years. I want to tell you about my patient, Yael Rosner, a former Miss Israel who had been struggling with her health. She says to me, I must admit that I was sure I was eating healthy since I was following the U.S. food pyramid. I became pre-diabetic, got neuropathy in my feet, hypertension, overweight, and bloating. When he had me switch to a low-carb diet, I started to sleep better and longer. My feet stopped hurting, my blood pressure dropped 20 points, and my blood glucose dropped 40. I'm losing pounds and people are complimenting me and I'm happier. So I'm not surprised at this. I've had thousands of patients over the years have great results with a low-carb diet. Jeremy Martin had spondylitis for 10 years. Painkillers ruined his gut. He took Cipro, which destroyed his tendons and nervous system. Years of eating high-carb foods was his cause. And now with the low-carb diet, he's off all medications, pain-free, down 60 pounds, and he's smiling again. These patients switched their diet to the opposite of the current dietary guidelines. Why is there such a discrepancy between the guidelines and these great results? Well, let me, ex let me explain it like this. Do you remember the six steps of the scientific method that we all learned in grade school? Here they are. Step one, make an observation. Step two, form a hypothesis. Step three, test that hypothesis with an experiment to see if it's actually true or not. Four, analyze the data, then report the data, then other scientists have to replicate it. Epidemiology is only the first two steps out of six. It is certainly missing the experiment. Therefore, it is an incomplete scientific process. It is mostly just survey. This includes the Blue Zones, Loma Linda, Seventh-day Adventists, Epic Data, Okinawans, Eskimo, and Enhanes. It is your charge by the law that you have to use the preponderance of science. It takes all six steps of the scientific method to qualify as science, not just the first two steps like in an epidemiological survey. The majority of your studies you're using are incomplete regarding scientific method. Therefore, they are not science and need to be discarded per the jurisdiction of the law that you're operating. <clears throat> we need diversity in the guidelines. There's no one diet for all. The low-carb diet has to be an option in your report, just like the American Diabetes Association did. There are 100 clinical trials, experiments, actual science, that proves the low-carb diet is safe and effective. Please add at least one line in your report that says a low-carb diet of 25% or less of calories from carbohydrates is a safe and viable option because it is. This is your opportunity to reverse 40 years of non-scientific guidelines and to be two scientists to finally solve our nation's health problem. And please don't make me have to come back in five years to repeat myself at the low-carb option now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Larry Diamond. I am a health coach and researcher from Austin, Texas. And I want to paint a picture of January 2013, um, 2013, seven years ago, 
what my health state was like at that time. I had been morbidly obese for well over 20 years, my entire adult life. I had all five markers of metabolic syndrome. I was constantly hungry and I was also constantly tired. And I had an epiphany, what if instead of the cause of my obesity um, being eating more and moving less, what if that was a result of the diet that I was following? And I was very much following a high carb recommended dietary guidelines of real foods. But for me, that was keeping me constantly in a state of high insulin. I had blood sugar swings, so I was hungry every few hours. I remember not being able to go as much as I wanted to more than a few hours without eating. And I had a family. I had advanced degrees. Like many, many Americans, why couldn't I stop eating? So I decided to delve into that aspect of my life. And I found that low-carb, real food diets between 50 grams and 130 grams created a condition of called fat adaptation. And that was the breakthrough that saved my life. And at the time, seven years ago, I had a newly adopted daughter with my wife, and I did not think that I would be alive today. So what is fat, ad fat adaptation, and why should a low carbohydrate option be included in the dietary guidelines? Fat adaptation means that during the day, you run on free fatty acids and ketones. Those are clean burning fuels for organs. You spare glucose for the few, few cells that need it in the brain, the red blood cells. You have steady blood glucose. You reverse metabolic syndrome. My trigs over HDL went from seven to well under one. You're never hungry because you have access in, with your own body fat at all times. So my family's healthy. My wife lost 70 pounds. I lost 120. We're terrifically energetic. Please include this option for all Americans. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to commenter number 44. Good afternoon. My name is Ted Eton, and I'm a family medicine specialist residing in Washington, D.C., here on behalf of the Nutrition Coalition. I have no ties to pharmaceutical, food, or device manufacturers because freedom from conflict of interest is important. It's amazing to be here in 2020 because I grew up with the first dietary guidelines in Phoenix, Arizona. I remember how my family responded to the mass media messages and how dramatically the food environment changed. For me, I was calorie restricting as early as age 12, unable to control my weight or appetite, and this is not normal. Kids and indeed all of us should feel satiated from eating a nutrient-dense, minimally processed food diet, and we should exist at a normal weight without much thought and then lead long, productive, healthy lives. It is now 2020, and when someone says they're eating healthy, we don't know what that means anymore. It might seem that a group like ours wants one specific dietary pattern endorsed in the 2020 DGA. This is not the case. Our goal is that nutrition policy be based on rigorous scientific evidence. We care that the recommendations that go out to all Americans be trustworthy, reliable, and up-to-date. The process for reviewing the science needs to be based on an accepted, state-of-the-art methodology like GRADE or Cochrane. With grade limited evidence, as you showed yesterday, it would be preferable to not issue a recommendation or issue a weak, a weak recommendation, which would allow health professionals to tailor their care to the needs of the people they serve. We only have to remember the reversals on dietary cholesterol and the low-fat diet to be reminded that caution is far better than overstepping what the science reliably tells us. We applaud you for considering a greater range of dietary patterns as well as types of dietary fats and the topics and questions under review. These include, importantly, the continued caps on saturated fats. These fats have been tested in rigorous clinical trials on tens of thousands of people in studies funded by the NIH, yet no Dietary Guidelines Committee has ever directly reviewed them. They are excluded from your review because they took place prior to 1990. Nineteen systematic reviews, including these trials, have been published since 2010. Please include this data in your review. This is gold standard data and it should not be ignored. Yesterday, we saw the horrific data regarding the metabolic health of Americans. Have you given up on the idea that the DGA should reduce chronic illness instead of accept its increased prevalence? 
Quoting the 2015 guideline, these guidelines embody the idea that a healthy eating pattern is not a rigid prescription, but rather an adaptable framework in which individuals can enjoy foods that meet their personal, cultural, and traditional preferences. This is what we need, a true range of dietary patterns based on rigorous clinical trial evidence. This would be a DGA we'd all be proud of. We're here to eliminate metabolic illness with you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Anthony Gustin. I'm a sports medicine and functional medicine clinician from Austin, Texas, and I've seen firsthand the power of nutrition in practice. Using my clinical experience, I've scaled a whole food, low-carb education platform that over 45 million people have engaged with. The results have been incredible. Thousands of people have used real food, low-carb diets to fix insulin resistance, diabetes, obesity, and more. I'm not against real food carbohydrates, rather for the recognition and inclusion of low-carb, defined as 25% or less of total calories from carb as a dietary option for people who may benefit from it. Over 60% of Americans have a chronic disease and can benefit from this approach, and the current 45% guideline won't be enough to turn their health around. I have full confidence that when the dietary guidelines are refreshed, we will collectively be intelligent enough to incorporate the results from hundreds of low-carb studies we've seen over the last five years, much like the ADA has done recently. More concerning to me is when we recommend a healthy low-carb nutrition pattern where the energy will come from. If you reduce carbs, you have to increase fat. However, the current guidelines demonize saturated fat and promote polyunsaturated fat. I understand the concern that saturated fat links to heart disease, but when you look at the science, it just doesn't hold up. This is not too dissimilar to the old recommendations for cholesterol that didn't pan out. Listening to everybody today, I know that this is going to be an unpopular opinion, but so was banning trans fat 30 years ago. Real food is not the problem. Saturated fat has been consumed for literally all of human history, yet heart disease only started becoming the killer it is over the last 100 years. Not coincidentally, exactly when seed oils or the recommended polyunsaturated fats in the current guidelines were first introduced. Saturated fats are stable in the body and not easily oxidized. They're used for things like energy metabolism, hormone production, cell membranes, nervous system maintenance, and more. Saturated fats are naturally found in both animal and plant foods. In the majority of, of fat in breast milk, the best food for a developing human is saturated fat. Humans do not lose the ability to use saturated fat after childhood. Polyunsaturated fat, by comparison, are highly reactive molecules. There are many carbon double bonds react violently like, with oxygen, like firecrackers in the body. This peroxidation cascade results in highly toxic compounds, mitochondrial and DNA damage and oxidation of LDL particles. Polyunsaturated fats come from heavily processed seeds going into oil. This processing takes massive machinery and many chemicals. No human in history was able, ever able to eat the nutrient void processed fat from thousands of seeds until the last 100 years. I agree with the stance of this community that people should be eating nutrient-dense whole foods, but the reality is real foods highest nutrition per gram are those that include saturated fat. Reducing polyunsaturated fat by allowing saturated fat shouldn't be controversial. You are literally replacing nutrient void, chemical rich, processed fake foods and industrial seed oils with natural nutrient rich whole foods that have saturated fat. There doesn't need to be a target for saturated fat, rather a rem removal of the current limitation, much like how the cholesterol limitation was dropped in the current guidelines. This will allow people to get the most amount of nutrition per gram of food while minimizing toxic seed oils. Please make the right call in dropping, dropping the limitations of saturated fat, much like you did with cholesterol in 2015. Thank you. Thank you. I've been a practicing cardiologist for about 30 years, and I have served in several leadership positions at Baylor College of Medicine and HCA Houston Healthcare. For the first 24 years of my practice, I advised my patients to follow a low-fat, healthy whole grain diet with emphasis on fruits, vegetables, and a reduction in animal food, sugar, and saturated fat. My patients did not improve on this diet despite being disciplined and following my recommendations. I saw them gradually becoming pre-diabetic or diabetic, increase their weight, and worsen their cholesterol. Many progressed to overt heart disease. It was a dreadful experience to go to my office because I felt I was ineffective and increasingly, increasingly reliant on medications that made their lives worse. About six years ago, because of my own personal experience, I began a low-carb diet, and I stand before you 30 pounds lighter and also applying the science of low-carb for my patients. I come across over 100 patients on a weekly basis. I have seen patients in their 70s, 80s, and 90s improve on a low-carb diet and intermittent fasting. One practice reinforces the other. Not only have I seen 30 to 50 pounds of weight loss, 
I have consistently seen them improve their blood sugar, their blood pressure, and their cholesterol quality. They have been able to stop many medications, diabetic, blood pressure, and lipid-lowering medications. This has been a transformative experience for me. My patient interaction is reinforced on a daily basis by our collective victory in their health. I constantly hear them talking about being satiated and having control over their hunger on a true low-carb diet, which should mean less than 20% of calories coming from carbs. Let us not forget that as humans, our brain is a thousand grams bigger than our closest ape ancestor. This is because we ate nutrient, calorie-dense animal food and learned the art of cooking. I humbly submit that a low-carb diet is a paradigm whose time has come and for DGA to include it as an option. While I cannot go into the science behind the low-carb diet in such a short time, there are plenty of robust clinical trials that give us the information that it reduces blood sugar, blood pressure, and improves cholesterol quality. Thank you. Thank you. We have commenter 53. My name is Doug, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Doug Reynolds, representing Low Carb USA. After discovering the concept of co carbohydrate restriction and reversing my own health issues, I established Low Carb USA to provide a platform for others to learn what I did not know until I was 51. It's important to recognize that this field has a growing mountain of rigorous clinical trial evidence behind it. While we applaud the initiative of the committee for proposing to add a low carb dietary pattern to the 2020 guidelines, I do have grave concerns about the current proposed definition for that pattern. A threshold of 45% of calories from carbs doesn't even come close to defining a low-carb diet. A separate analysis of the science, scientific literature looking only at studies below 25% is encouraged, as this is the upper limit of the threshold. More important would be to additionally define a ketogenic subcategory advising 10% or less. The differences you will see in each of these groups is vast. At levels below 25%, we eliminate sugar and processed carbohydrates and basically just eat real food. This results in enormous improvements in general health. Low Carb USA established a panel of advisors of highly respected scientists and physicians from around the world, and in May 2019, we published a set of clinical guidelines for therapeutic carbohydrate reduction as an intervention for use by physicians. This identifies a number of low-carb categories with thresholds defined in grams of carbs as opposed to percentages. The two lowest of these are very low-carb ketogenic, which is less than 30 grams, and low-carb ketogenic, 30 to 50 grams. It's at these levels that the magic happens. In other words, significant metabolic changes occur, including drastically reduced levels of inflammation resulting in reduced chronic disease. There are now hundreds of thousands of documented clinical cases for the reversal of many chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, all pre previously thought to be incurable. And every day we hear about more. The truth is that adding the currently proposed low-carb pattern will do far more harm than good. The dietary guidelines are supposed to only be for healthy people, but this is only about 12% of the population. The reality is that the guidelines are highly influential in establishing the food policies of most institutions like hospitals, schools, and our military, and they set the gold standard for clinical trials. Running a clinical trial comparing any other dietary pattern against the so-called low-carb pattern consisting of 40 to 45 percent carbs would just result in more inconclusive evidence, because it's not low-carb. I hope you will recommend guidelines with a true range of dietary patterns for all Americans, including the vast majority of us struggling with the diet-related diseases, not just a tiny elite 14%. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Molly McAdams. I'm a rancher. I'm a steward of the land. I'm also a PhD level scientist, a businesswoman, and the mother of a teenaged athlete. My family's Texas ranch, which is about 90 miles north of here, has operated and provided beef to Americans since the 1830s. Across the human lifespan, beef is a great tasting, nutrient-rich food that plays an important role in any healthy diet, including healthy pregnancies, growth and development of children, 
adults who want to maintain strength and energy, older Americans who want to age vibrantly. Beef delivers great nutrition as a single ingredient, real food that people enjoy eating. As a supporter of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and through the Beef Checkoff, I've proudly contributed to scientific research about this nutrient-rich food. And thanks to cattle raising practices, beef is leaner than ever before. Over 20 gold standard studies have shown that beef contributes favorably to heart health and other positive health outcomes. And today, the amount of beef we eat is consistent with what science shows to support healthy diets and is within current DGA recommendations. We don't need to cut back on beef intake to eat a healthier diet. Rather, we should eat more nutrient-rich foods and less empty calories. History and science have shown that limiting meat doesn't help people eat better and can actually lead to overconsumption of refined carbs, as well as foods high in added sugars and sodium. Research now shows that plant-based diets aren't a silver bullet either. In addition, many Americans benefit from a low-carb, higher-protein diet with meat, and DGA should encourage this choice. I'm a former grocery executive who led product development and health and wellness. I can tell you that America's favorite protein food is beef. What a great opportunity, because beef pairs perfectly with foods that people aren't eating enough of, like vegetables and whole grains. In fact, many Americans would benefit from getting more nutrients like protein, iron, B vitamins, and choline, all of which are easily found in beef, but are not as easily found in plant foods. On behalf of all who grow cattle, which are uniquely suited to convert inedible plants into high quality, nourishing protein for humans to enjoy, and all of this is done on land that's not suitable for farming crops, and as the mom of a growing athlete who needs protein-rich diets to thrive, I thank the committee for your work, your steadfast commitment to developing 2020 recommendations based on sound nutrition science. Thank you.